Hello everyone, my name is Michael Jin and I am a PGY3 from Stony Brook University Hospital. Today, I'm going to share with you a guide to interventional radiology procedures co-developed with one of my co-residents, Amina Farouk. First, a disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in this presentation may contain interesting facts and workflow shortcuts. The audience discretion is advised. So what is interventional radiology? Interventional radiology is the art and science of image-guided, minimally invasive non-surgical procedures. With the use of imaging guidance, interventional radiologists are able to access so many organ systems throughout the body with very small openings. This diagram just lists some of the simple things we can do. Much of what we do is based off this classic technique, the Seldinger technique, invented by Dr. Savan Ivar Seldinger, in which we use a needle to access an area, use a small wire to keep that area for access, and then insert a sheath, which will allow us to use a variety of different tools for a procedure. Final step, success. Through this technique, interventional radiologists can place lines such as ports, picks, tunnel catheters. We can unclog blood vessels with mechanical venous thrombectomy. We can open blood vessels with angioplasty and stenting. We can prevent clots from blocking blood vessels with IVC filters of all different shapes and sizes and different levels of permanence. We can go and block blood vessels with embolization, both with temporary embolizing agents, permanent agents, and coiling. We can drain urine, we can drain bile, and we can create shunts between different organs. This, for example, is a transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt. It tips, if you will. And against cancers, we can embolize them, poison them, freeze them, zap them, burn them, and find other fun ways to destroy them. Interventional radiologists play a role in working with almost every other service, and we are here to serve your needs for the patient. However, before intervention radiology even touches the patient, there are things that floor services can do to help the patient prepare for procedures to ensure there is no lag in patient care. Pre-op. First, consent needs to be obtained for the procedure. Most IR teams do consent on the patients themselves, but floor teams can help by ensuring that the patient or surrogate is present and able to provide consent. If a procedure requires sedation, it will likely be minimal to moderate sedation in the form of fentanyl and Versed. In some cases in which the patient has comorbidities and cannot protect their own airway, general, general anesthesia may be required. This will be discussed during the consenting process, but for the most cases, the patient should be made aware that they will be awake during the procedure, but will feel detached. With that being said, even moderate sedation procedures require patients to be MPO to prevent aspiration. The American Society of Anesthesiologists created new guidelines in 2018 that dictate the minimum fasting periods for different types of foods. But in general, IR will inform the team if MPO status is needed. Also, make sure that the relevant consults and imaging are present. For example, if a patient is septic, make sure ID is included and are involved in seeing the patient prior to the procedure. If the patient needs an LP, neurology team should also be involved. Usually, they try to do the procedure first by bedside. Next, make sure the patient has the relevant labs for the procedure because any procedure we do has a risk of bleeding. And finally, medications that need to be stopped must be stopped.
These medications include anticoagulation, antiplatelet agents, but depending on the patient, sometimes the medication must stay on. So how do you decide whether a patient can come off of anticoagulation or antiplatelets? There are guidelines you can follow, but first you have to consider the patient's bleeding risk and thrombosis risk. Here is a score you probably learned about in medical school, the chad vas score. With this guide, a score greater than seven indicates significant thrombosis risk, and a score less than four indicates low thrombosis risk. Additionally, you have to consider the patient's bleeding risk as well. This is the HAS-BLAD score, where a score of greater than three is predictive of significant bleeding events. However, please note these are only guidelines. The actual clinical action plan varies from patient to patient. With the patient's risk of thrombosis and bleeding taken into account, you can now consider if the procedure has a high or low risk of bleeding. These diagrams are taken from the new JVIR guidelines. If the procedure has low risk of bleeding and the patient has a low risk of bleeding, anticoagulation can usually be continued. However, if the procedure has a high risk of bleeding or if the patient has a high risk of bleeding, you have to consider if the procedure is emergent or not. If it is emergent, you should consider reversal of anticoagulation before the procedure. If the procedure is not emergent, you have to consider if the patient has a high th thrombotic risk. If the risk is not high, then you can stop anticoagulation. If the risk is high, you should consider a heparin bridge prior to the procedure, which entails stopping the patient's normal anticoagulation for heparin instead. A similar flowchart can be applied to patients with cardiac stents on dual antiplatelet therapy. If the planned procedure has a low risk of bleeding, the patient can continue dual antiplatelet therapy. However, if the planned procedure has a high risk of bleeding, you need to consider the age of the stent. If the stent was played less than one year prior, Cardiology, internal medicine, or vascular surgery should be consulted for management recommendations depending on your hospital's policy. However, if a stent was placed more than one year ago, aspirin can usually be continued, but a second antiplatelet agent can be held, usually five days prior to the procedure. Cardiology, internal medicine, or vascular surgery can still be consulted for management recommendations if the situation warrants. So at this point, you might wonder what are considered low bleeding risk procedures and what are considered high bleeding risk procedures. Here is a list of low bleeding risk procedures. Low risk of bleeding procedures generally involve procedures with few needle sticks and are generally shorter in duration. Penetration of organs are also generally superficial. For these procedures, laboratory studies are still required, but the recommendation for lab cutoffs are less conservative than with procedures with high bleeding risks. INR should be corrected to within the range of two to three, depending on your hospital policy, and platelets should be higher than 20,000. Procedures with high bleeding risk generally involve more needle sticks, take longer time, use bigger needles, or involve more trauma to organs. For these procedures, INR should be less than 1.5 to 1.8, and platelets should be greater than 50,000. Holding parameters for medications can also vary between high bleeding risk and low bleeding risk procedures. This table of anticoagulation and antiplatelet holding parameters are based off of JVIR 2019 guidelines. This table is high yield, so please feel free to take a picture for your own records. When in doubt, you should consult either the JVIR guidelines or your institutional guidelines for holding parameters. For the next part of our lecture, we will talk about post-procedure practices. After the procedure, the patient must be monitored. 
The team and patients should check the incision site from the procedure and monitor the perfusion for the extremely distal from the procedure access point for up to six hours. Patients' vital signs should also be regularly assessed. Dressings should be dry and clean. And if the patient receives sedation, they should refrain from operating machinery for the rest of the day and limit strenuous activity, especially if a port was just placed to prevent wound dehiscence. It should be kept in mind that minimal drainage around new tubes is common. If there are a lot of drainage, frequent dressing changes and appropriate skin care is recommended. For lumbar punctures, lie the patient at 45 degrees. For femoral sticks, make sure the patient does not bend their lower extremity for six hours. There are also guidelines for restarting anticoagulation and antiplatelet agents. For patients with low bleeding risks, anticoagulation can be started without heparin bridge for most patients. But if the patient has atrial fibrillation, acute blood clots in the leg, and wish to take some form of novel oral anticoagulants, or if the patient has a mechanical heart valve, anticoagulation should be started with a heparin bridge. Alternatively, if a patient has persistent risk for continued bleeding, the risk of thrombosis should be assessed using guidelines such as CHAT-VASC, which we described earlier. If the thrombosis risk is low, anticoagulation can usually be held. If the risk of thrombosis is high, low-dose anticoagulation with unfractionated heparin should be considered. There are more exact guidelines for when to restart anticoagulation, but a general rule of thumb includes 6 hours post-op for heparin, 12 hours post-op for Novinox, and 24 hours post-op for everything else. Before we conclude, I want to give a couple quick pointers regarding commonly asked questions to the IR surface. For procedures, it's important to note that G-tubes can be used in most instances. J-tubes are for patients who have aspiration risks, vomiting, or gastroparesis because it bypasses the polydorus. It is not for everyone because feeding through the J-tube requires slow and continuous feeds to prevent dumping syndrome. Additionally, not all lines are the same. It is important to mention the purpose of the line in the request, and at times important to mention the duration of the access needed and the number of lumens required. Single lumen picks are just fine for antibiotics or IV pain medications. Single lumen ports are also usually fine for chemotherapy. Dialysis usually needs two lumens. More lumens, however, is not always better because they have smaller openings with higher chance of occlusion. Inpatient ports are also more prone to infection, which is literature based. So if possible, outpatient ports should be placed. Finally, we could drain fluid collections if it's big and shaped like a bubble for example, the image with a smiley face next to it. If it's more hazy and small, we may not be able to drain it as well. So, pop quiz. What are the five parts of the pre-op checklist? The five parts are, one, ensure that a patient with surrogate is present to provide consent. Also ensure that the decision maker is aware that most procedures are performed with minimal to moderate sedation, not general anesthesia. Two, place the patient MPO if needed. Three, ensure the relevant imaging and consults are present, including ID if the patient is septic, and neurology if the patient needs a lumbar puncture. Four, ensure the relevant labs are ordered. And five, stop anticoagulation and antiplatelet medications as needed. Thank you so much for your attention and I hope this presentation was helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or Amina.
Our emails are listed on this slide.